We begin tonight's event by acknowledging that the University of Massachusetts Amherst was founded and built on indigenous lands. UMass has an official land acknowledgement developed over several years of consultation with local indigenous communities. And I encourage you to check out the written statement on the UMass website. It reminds us that the Nolwetog people of this place and their neighbors lived here for millennia, stewarding the lands and waters. The colonial processes that Dr. Karuga will talk about tonight happened right here, displacing people from Nolwetog, Pakumtuk, Agawam, and other local communities. Their descendants found a home with relatives who continue to care for these lands and waters today, including Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag, Nipmuc, Narragansett, Mohegan, Pequot, Mohican, and Abenaki communities who continue to push back against colonialism. We also acknowledge that the University of Massachusetts Amherst is a land-grant university. As part of the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862, portions of land from 82 native nations west of the Mississippi were sold to provide the resources to found and build this university. As an active first step toward decolonization, you can learn more about the native nations whose homelands UMass Amherst now resides on and the indigenous homelands on which you live and work. It's my honor to introduce to you tonight's lecture, The Imperialist Roots of the USA by Dr. Manu Karuga. This event is presented by the family, Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series, offered every other year by the Department of History at UMass Amherst. Each Feinberg series focuses on a big issue with deep historical roots and pro profound relevance to the present. This year's series, Confronting Empire, is exploring global histories of US imperialism and anti-imperialist resistance. We cover a vast history of US empire from its roots as a settler colonial state to overseas expansion to the wars of the 21st century with a particular focus on the Americas, Vietnam, and Iraq. I encourage you to visit the Feinberg series website to learn more. There, you can also view recordings of past events and register for future events, including the next event on November 1st, a panel on US empire in Asia and the Pacific. Teaching Empire, a free workshop series for K-12 educators and a follow-up conversation to complement this event from the UMass W.E.B. Du Bois Center. If you are attending by Zoom, you can find more information about these offerings in the chat box, along with information on how to turn on live closed captioning and how to listen to tonight's event in Spanish. If you are attending this event as part of a class, like my students, you'll also want to look to the chat box for a link to our sign-in sheet. If you are here in person, you can find all of these links on the quarter sheet that's on your chair or perhaps under you. It includes a link to the Zoom event, which would enable you to listen in to the Spanish interpretation on your phone and also uh, to post questions during and after the talk. Before we begin, I'd also like to thank the more than three dozen university and community partners who collaborated with the UMass Amherst History Department to co-present this series in particular, the Ellsberg Initiative for Peace and Democracy. I also thank the large team of students, faculty, and staff whose collaborative efforts brought this series to fruition, and Kenneth R. Feinberg and Associates, whose generosity makes this series possible. I think they deserve a hand, right? So. Okay, it is now, Finally, my great pleasure to introduce Manu Karuga, and um, he's an assistant professor of American studies at Barnard College. 
He earned his PhD in American studies at New York University. I met him many years ago when his first book, Empires Tracks, Indigenous Nations, Chinese Workers, and the Transcontinental Railroad was still a dissertation in progress. This was the first time I encountered work that connected these different themes and it forced me to expand my understanding of US and indigenous history. So I was really waiting for your book. Dr. Karuga is a brilliant public intellectual whose thoughtful, accessible and nuanced work centers a critique of imperialism with a focus on anti-racism and indigenous decolonization. After his presentation, uh, I'll be joining him on stage for Q&A, uh, and that will be guided by your questions. So as you listen, uh, please use the Q&A form that's linked to the chat and on your flyer, and uh, there's a whole team of people uh, organizing the questions. So now, please join me in welcoming Manu Karuga. Um, well, first, a uh, big thanks to Professor Nash for the warm welcome and introduction. It feels really good to be, to be in Amherst with all of you. Um, it's a homecoming of sorts. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, those of you who are on Zoom, you missed Fela Kuti was playing in the room, so we have some good spirit and energy to start out with. So... Um, some years ago when I was living here in Amherst, I was able to use the library here at UMass because I was a resident in town. And some of the things I learned from those books I checked out will shape the things that I'm gonna talk about today. I think that a university's library or a college's library can tell us a great deal about the values and the ethos of that institution. And it's really, I think it's really striking here at UMass that anyone living in town can use the library. It kind of signaled to me then and now that UMass is open and accessible to the community, to the public, in a way that in my experience is, is really unique in colleges and universities in the United States. Of course, the library here at UMass also holds the archives of W.E.B. Du Bois, who's our greatest intellectual. Just by you know, that work, which is a great service to, to all of us, I think UMass really demonstrates its commitments to intellectual rigor and to the role, the constructive role of the intellectual in society. It's also a great honor for me to be speaking as part of this year's Feinberg series on confronting empire, on US imperialism and anti-imperialist resistance. As hopefully will become clear in my talk, I think this is one of the most important or maybe the most important question that our species faces. So it's a, I wanna commend the series organizers for doing this work. And it's a great honor to speak on a series co-sponsored by the Ellsberg Initiative for Peace and Democracy, which carries the name of Daniel Ellsberg, who will be speaking later as part of the series in a later event who of course put his life on the line um, to help bring about a quicker end to the US war against Vietnam. I think we can all take inspiration from his courage and his integrity. And um, we should all learn from his work. And I'll be invoking some of it later in the talk. So with a handful of exceptions, lodged conspicuously in the history departments of elite universities, Imperialism is a word of opprobrium. During World War II, the freedom struggle across the colonized world advanced the argument that defeating fascism would necessarily entail defeating imperialism. The years after the war saw a wave of decolonization across Asia and Africa, seeming to fulfill this prediction. Some began to imagine that imperialism was a thing of the past, going so far as to suggest that the United States played a pivotal role in this turn. As it quickly became clear to leaders of newly decolonized nations, while the imperialists had retreated, imperialism itself had changed form. 
Within U.S. culture, habits of thought tend to rest on emotional appeals. We're told, for example, that the United States was founded on the ideals of freedom and democracy. The concepts themselves are treated as self-evident. Take a term like terrorism. Iqbal Ahmed wrote that politicians using the term express it emotively, polemically, to arouse our emotions rather than exercise our intelligence. In this kind of political culture, imperialism is also treated as an idea, drawing on emotional appeals. Against an emotional approach to understanding imperialism resting on faith, we can consider a rational approach based on evidence. Imperialism is not an idea or a feeling. Imperialism is a set of material relations. Defining imperialism took on sharp significance in the second decade of the 20th century. Europe, having enjoyed what appeared as decades of peace and prosperity, faced the outbreak of war on a seemingly unprecedented scale. Leaders of the belligerent great powers appealed to ideas like nationalism, freedom, and progress. Others looked instead to history to assess the situation. In his 1915 essay, The African Roots of War, W.E.B. Du Bois explained that imperialism was the cause of World War I. European prosperity was driven by the capture of wealth in what he called the darker nations of the world. Surveying history, Du Bois concluded that the ownership of materials and men in the darker world is the real prize that is setting the nations of Europe at each other's throats today. Du Bois gives us a definition of imperialism that proceeds from concrete reality, not from emotions. Taking a historical perspective clarifies that as Samir Amin noted, capitalism and imperialism are the two inseparable faces of the same reality. From its origins, capitalism has involved capturing resources, the products of labor, even people themselves, to enrich people in other places. From the 16th century onwards, capitalism has fueled luxury consumption in its core cities alongside mass starvation in the rural and colonized hinterlands. As capitalist economies developed and expanded, they came into contact and modified pre-capitalist economies. Colonialism destabilized colonized economies, displacing artisanal workers such as weavers who could not compete with industrially produced textiles, for example. Imperialism, Utsa and Prabhat Patnaik argue, has manifested through processes of deindustrialization going back centuries, processes that suppress the wages and the livelihoods of workers and farmers in the colonies, in the peripheries of capitalism. Competition is usually understood as a fundamental economic characteristic of capitalism. Over time, however, competition leads to monopoly as a smaller number of firms captures an ever greater share of the market. This process can be tracked out historically, whether in the 19th century market in handguns or the late 20th century market in internet search engines. Monopoly profits go to private hands, while monopoly losses are paid for by society at large. This is the meaning behind the phrase, too big to fail, which we heard so much after the 2008 debt financial crisis. Profit for monopolies increasingly becomes a matter of collecting rent. From taxes levied on rural cultivators in the 19th century colonies, to intellectual property law applied to manufacturing in the global south in the era of globalization. As monopoly firms increasingly collect surplus in the form of rent payments, they turn to debt as a vehicle for further growth and expansion. From the production of goods and services, capitalism transitions into the production of debt. Imperialism, the Putnaics argue, 
is a process of draining wealth. Colonial land law elevated the power of rural landowners, while colonial tax revenues were siphoned off to the wealthy countries. This process continues in modified form in our present moment. The drain of wealth has enabled wealthy countries to maintain massive trade deficits, acquiring free goods through the payment of resources and commodities as the equivalent of taxes or debt payments. Um, five of the so-called G7, five of those countries run massive trade deficits. So this is very much a contemporary phenomenon. This process is sustained under the threat of war. The development of monopolies erodes democracy and de democratic rights, producing a political situation that tends towards extreme and explosive violence. As Samir Amin wrote, international political violence takes the place of economic competition. Imperialism drives towards catastrophic war and destruction. This is how Du Bois assessed the African roots of the First World War. Against an emotional understanding of imperialism, a historical approach sees imperialism as an inherent feature of capitalism. Imperialism is not a particular policy of a particular government, political party, or political leader. Imperialism is a method of class rule. As Du Bois argued, imperialism fosters war at ever greater scales. This tendency towards war is an inherent aspect of imperialism. Military confrontation in the present offers avenues for investment in the future. Debt payments on international loans or taxes levied on rural communities are collected under the threat of war. For years, scholars of US history and culture have wrestled with the question, what distinguishes the United States from Europe? Unlike Europe, we've been told, the US was never a feudal society. Correspondingly, unlike Europe, we've been told, the US does not have firm class divisions. These answers provide core components of US nationalist ideology. The United States, as the story goes, is something new in the world, a noble experiment, a shining example to all of humanity. It is a nation governed and founded on ideals such as freedom and equality. Moving from ideals and emotions to material reality requires a very different understanding of US history. Picture, for example, the map of the United States in your mind's eye. Studying US history underscores that there's nothing inevitable, nothing permanent about these borders. History instead offers countless examples of other possible geographies. History suggests possibilities in which the very structure of the United States would be different. In 1778, the US negotiated a treaty with the Delaware Nation. It's remembered historically as the first treaty the United States signed with an indigenous nation. And it's one of the very first treaties that the United States signed with any nation. So 1778, treaty with the Delaware Nation the treaty recognized Delaware sovereignty, including Delaware legal systems, and Delaware rights to, in, to engage in international trade. And further, the treaty raised the possibility that an intertribal confederation could be incorporated as a state within the United States framework with congressional representation. So an entirely different structure of the United States than the one we live in now. So picture that map of the United States in your mind's eye. It appears as the territory of a single nation. When we study the history of this continent, the map takes a much more complex form. Not the territory of a single nation, but instead the territory of over 500 distinct nations. North America, in other words, is a profoundly international space. What happened to all of these nations? How do these nations participate in the international arena, 
in international trade and diplomacy. North America is part of the colonized world. The salient question for scholars is not what distinguishes the United States from Europe, but what distinguishes North America from the colonized world, what Du Bois referred to as the darker nations of the world. The political, economic, cultural, and ecological transformations taking place in North America can be understood in relation to historical processes underway in other parts of the colonized world. Everything from the development of land law and taxation to the enforcement of clock time to ecological despoliation to the shocking levels of violence against working people in this country. All of this can be understood with greater clarity in the context of the history of colonialism. The historian John Grenier has traced out a distinct tradition of US war fighting. It consists of several principles which continue to shape how the US fights wars. Irregular troops, colonial militias or contemporary special forces deliberately target food sources, villages and civilian populations. This distinct approach to fighting war, Grenier, Grenier argues, has informed the entire course of US military history from the 1637 Pequot massacre to the wars against indigenous nations west of the Mississippi in the second half of the 19th century, to the occupation of the Philippines in the beginning of the 20th century, to the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan at the beginning of this century. This tradition of war, in turn, inspired other colonizing efforts. Writing on French military campaigns in Algeria in 1841, Alexis de Tocqueville, the scribe of American democracy, chided fellow Frenchmen who, in his words, find it wrong that we burn harvests, that we burn silos, that we seize unarmed women, men, and children. In Europe, Tocqueville explained, France waged war against governments. In Africa, it waged war against entire peoples. Neil Salisbury argued that the colonial invasion in New England revealed the English settlers' tendencies towards atomistic individualism and materialism. Puritan ideologues, he explained, sought to reconcile these tendencies with the myth of New England's redemptive purpose by transforming each quest for land into a crusade against what they presented as the savage Indians and by defining the social and cultural differences between the two peoples in terms of religious and moral absolutes. Colonial leaders in Massachusetts and Connecticut, fearing the establishment of anti-colonial alliances between indigenous nations, sought to extinguish political possibility with the collective terror of civilian massacres. War has been a constant fact of US history. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz has tallied the record of military mobilization across the entirety of US history. She finds that there have been a few days, if even a few days, when the United States has not had active military operations against another nation. Against ideals of freedom, equality, and democracy, the actual historical orientation of the United States has been towards permanent war. Within and beyond US borders, the, U the US manifests in the first way of war, deliberately targeting civilians, their homes, and their food. In her 1883 book, Life Among the Paiutes, Sarah Winnemucca noted, the only way the cattlemen and farmers get to make money is to start an Indian war so that the troops may come and buy their beef, cattle, horses, and grain. The settlers get fat by it. Key sectors of the US economy, farming, ranching, manufacturing, mining, all of these originated in war, and war remained central to their ongoing operation. Samuel Colt of Hartford, Connecticut, innovated the assembly line production of firearms. His fledgling company was kept afloat by contracts 
during the U.S. wars against the Seminole Nation, which was the most expensive military engagement the United States had fought until that time. And the United States, incidentally, was unable to defeat the Seminoles. Colt's guns were later favored by the Texas Rangers in their wars against the Comanches. In 1847, Colt's manufacturing company signed a lucrative contract to provide firearms for the U.S. invasion of Mexico. With the profits from this contract, Colt began to invest in mining operations in the Arizona territories that the United States had captured in the course of that war. After Colt's patents expired, Smith & Wesson Company of Springfield, Massachusetts rose to prominence, supplying both sides of the U.S. Civil War. The Winchester rifle, a core technology of U.S. warfare west of the Mississippi, was built in New Haven. Weapons manufacturers amassed wealth and consolidated market share through contracts with the federal government. This pattern, of course, persists in the present day. In the recent weeks, we've seen congressional grants of tens of billions of dollars of military aid to Ukraine and Taiwan to U.S. weapons manufacturers. And the total amount of this aid already far exceeds the higher estimates of how much it would cost to repair the water system in Jackson, Mississippi. This historical record of war has required financial support. The early history of European colonization and settlement in North America is a history of financial institutions. The Dutch East India Company, the Virginia Company, the Massachusetts Bay Company. Each of these organizations were chartered in European capitals, pooling investments to mitigate risk. There was no guarantee that these colonial outposts would survive. The expectation was that they wouldn't. Investors in these companies included wealthy merchants and aristocrats. These investors shared interests in particular outcomes, which would maximize their returns, not just the survival, but the expansion of their colonies. Private enterprises established police, courts, militias, and taxation in European colonial outposts in North America, ceding these functions over time to the British Empire. In the history of the United States, the corporation preceded the state. Slavery is an economic system based on the buying and selling of human beings. Every aspect of finance shaped the historical development of transatlantic slavery. Slave owners were also landowners, the proprietors of large estates. As Stephanie Smallwood described in her book, Saltwater Slavery, investors pooled resources to fund the voyages of slave ships. Insurers provided policies on the cargo. Captains and investors experimented with limiting their costs to keep their captives alive and subdued against their sale price. In North America itself, all of these financial functions interacted with the new market in colonial land claims. Enslaved people, as Du Bois insisted we remembered, were legally classified as a type of real estate. U.S. expansion into the Deep South during the era of Indian removals and the ensuing development of the Cotton Kingdom were accomplished in relation to financial institutions, including insurance corporations based along the Connecticut River Valley. Harford's claim to be the insurance capital of the world signifies the historical legacies of slavery. The construction of the U.S. rail network facilitated the development of whole new industries, accelerating economic unification on a continental scale. Beginning in 1850, Congress granted millions of acres of unseated of, of land to railroad corporations, which used these lands to package and shares and bonds, which they sold in order to fund construction and maintenance of the railroads. Almost all of this land was unceded indigenous land. Congress gave away land 
that was not under its jurisdiction to private corporations. In doing so, Congress violated its own treaties. It violated Article VI of its own constitution, which states that all treaties made by the U.S. shall be the supreme law of the land. By granting unceded indigenous land, the U.S. Congress made a claim to the future of these lands. Those who invested in these lands, including Midwestern farmers and British, Dutch, and Scandinavian investors, were likewise investing in particular futures. These futures did not include indigenous sovereignty or the flourishing of indigenous nations on their own lands. Having turned over the land of other nations to private corporations, then turned over military resources to protect railroad work crews, rail stations, and the rails themselves. Railroad construction took the form of a military occupation. Once built, the U.S. Army used the railroads to move troops and weapons at great distances, at great speed. U.S. military officers developed new tactics, such as what they call something they called the winter campaign, which moved troops in the thick of winter when mobility and access to food was, was the hardest, was impeded by deep snow. And these troops moving on rails would hunt down and destroy indigenous villages. The completed railroads raised questions of taxation, of the relationship between the corporation and the state. In its 1886 decision, Santa Clara versus Southern Pacific Railroad Company, the US Supreme Court found that corporations have the rights of people, as laid out in the 14th Amendment. As, a, as the personhood of freed people and their descendants was being violently abridged in the process that Du Bois referred to as the counter-revolution of property, at this very same time, corporations were being vested with the legal rights of persons, rights which they continue to enjoy to this day. The history of US imperialism charts the formation of a ruling class, its capture of power, and the maintenance of its grip over politics, economics, and culture. This process involves restricting the sovereignty of other nations, particularly around questions of trade under threat of violence. As the United States and its economy expanded, it blockaded indigenous nations from the possibility of direct trade or diplomacy with other nations, except through the mediation of the US government. Before the 1823 Monroe Doctrine, there was the Trade and Intercourse Act, which was initially passed in 1790, just a dozen years after the treaty with the Delaware where the treaty had suggested the possibility of incorporating indigenous nations as states within the developing US federal system, the Trade and Intercourse Act prevented indigenous nations from asserting their sovereign rights to engage in international trade or diplomacy under the threat of military attack. A clear perspective on the imperialist roots of the USA can allow us to ask some basic questions about the nature of US sovereignty. Where did this sovereignty originate? What makes it coherent? What are its geographic and political boundaries? US sovereignty manifests in reaction to the political orders which preceded European colonization and settlement in North America and which have persisted and developed alongside it to the present day. U.S. nationalism, which derives from it, is likewise a form of reaction. When you picture in your mind's eye the map of the continental U.S., you're picturing a map of imperialism on a continental scale. This map lodges itself in our collective consciousness through intense violence. Colonies of settlement involve large-scale population transfers the theft of land and resources accomplished by the extinguishing of existing political and cultural orders. For the historian Gerald Horn, settler colonialism is marked by class collaboration, the promise of free land 
and the fantasy of upward class mobility draws the working classes and the poor to collaborate with their exploiters. It diffuses class struggle. The American dream is at its heart a manifestation of the imperial relationship of the United States to its home territories, and since the end of World War II, to the world at large. We're living on the precipice of total destruction. The sixth major extinction in Earth's history is well underway, triggered in large part by policies and actions that have fueled US global supremacy. We're living through three major crises, the drive, towards U, the drive towards nuclear war, the destruction of the atmosphere, and the grinding assault of poverty. Each of these can be traced back to imperialism. In his book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, which I think everybody should read, Daniel Ellsberg wrote, whether rightly or wrongly, we're the only country in the world that believes it won a war by bombing, specifically by bombing cities with weapons of mass destruction, firebombs and atomic bombs, and believes that it was fully justified in doing so. It is a dangerous state of mind. Nuclear doctrine originated in aerial bombing campaigns. Aerial bombing began as colonial warfare. It began to evoke Tocqueville in the form of war against peoples, not as war against governments. The British Air Force developed the first bombing campaigns, terrorizing rural communities in Iraq into submission. Italian officials honed these tactics in Libya. Strategic bombing began with the use of chemical and incendiary weapons to produce firestorms and mass casualties. The U.S. Air Force studied at the feet of these teachers. In World War II, U.S. bombers targeted urban working class districts in Germany and Japan to maximize the destruction of life in the months preceding the bombing of Hiroshima. Current debates over nuclear war are taking place amidst new developments in aerial warfare. U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan, for example, have injured and killed civilians, destroying their homes, striking against social gatherings and against first responders, which is a war crime. The NATO destruction of Libya was conducted almost entirely as an air war. In April 2017, the US Air Force dropped the largest non-nuclear bomb in history in Afghanistan. Nuclear war also happens on the ground. Depleted uranium ammunition left by US occupation forces litters the Iraqi countryside, triggering shocking spikes of cancer and infant mortality. Within US borders, uranium mining is concentrated on tribal lands in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Arizona. The US has tested nuclear weapons on indigenous lands in New Mexico, Nevada, and the Pacific, making these some of the most bombed nations on Earth. The US government reserves the right to initiate nuclear war with any country in the world. This is the official policy of the United States, and it has been since World War II. During its war against Korea, US officials publicly suggested using nuclear weapons. During its war against Vietnam, as Ellsberg writes, the US threatened to use nuclear weapons on at least 13 different occasions. And according to the, the UN Genocide Convention, this actually, the letter of the UN Genocide Convention, this is, a, this is the crime of genocide. In May 2021, the US Indo-Pacific Command proposed a $27.4 billion missile network in the first island chain, which is a chain of islands located in the Western Pacific, from Northern Japan to the Philippines, with Taiwan as the fulcrum. And these, this missile network, the missiles 
would be or will be facing China. The strategy involves rendering these regional allies as a sacrifice zone in the event of a war against China. The first strike uh, would be against this island chain, the first island chain. The Department of Defense insists that effective nuclear deterrence requires a credible nuclear capability and the resolve to use it if, if required. The idea of nuclear deterrence implies retaliatory nuclear strikes, resulting in the destruction of life on Earth, which is what philosophers have, have thought about as under the, under the rubric of omnicide. In 2021, the Department of Defense requested $28.9 billion to fund nuclear modernization, um, the modernization of its nuclear arsenal. And this is more than 4% of the overall military budget. If we compare this to the anemic proposals for student, uh, for student debt loan, student loan forgiveness, um, this is oh, more than twice of the amount that's been earmarked for student loan forgiveness. But in recent weeks, of course, the reporting on student loan forgiveness has been that this will spike inflation, this will cause inflation. No conversation about nuclear modernization and its effects on the economy. In June 2002, the US withdrew from the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. In February 2019, the US withdrew from the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. In May 2020, the US withdrew from the Open Skies Treaty. These three treaties were signed with, between the United States and the Soviet Union, and they were part of an architecture to prevent uh, the possibility of a nuclear war from breaking out. The 2018 US withdrawal from the JCPOA, the so-called Iran nuclear deal, can be understood in this context. We should also recall a long historical record of US abrogations and withdrawals of treaties signed with North American indigenous nations, including Congress's 1871 unilateral declaration that it, it would end making treaties with tribal nations. Daniel Ellsberg describes how the night before the 1945 Trinity nuclear test, Physicist Enrico Fermi took bets on whether the explosion would burn New Mexico or whether it would ignite the Earth's atmosphere. If I remember correctly, they had calculated there was something like a 10% chance that the first nuclear test would trigger a chain reaction that would just burn the entire atmosphere of the planet. So 10% chance, and they decided this was a risk worth taking. Risk is a category of war as much as of finance. The US military is, of course, the world's largest emitter of fossil fuels. War has shaped US culture as a culture of ecological destruction. For example, in the aftermath of the first US war on Iraq, General Motors repackaged the Humvee troop vehicle into a commercial product, the Hummer, complete with celebrity endorsements. Arnold Schwarzenegger really loved his Hummer. In the following years, the US auto market pivoted to where it is now. And trucks and SUVs now make over 80% of new vehicle sales in the United States. In September 2000, the Project for a New, a new American Century released a report, Rebuilding America's Defenses, calling for the expansion of US fossil fuels production in order to enshrine what they called energy independence. Two decades later, this has been achieved largely through unlocking new sources of oil and natural gas through fracking. Fracking, of course, results in a landscape almost incapable of supporting plant and animal life. The Bakken Shale Formation, which is the largest fracking area on Earth, actually can be viewed from outer space. The European Union has recently moved to reclassify fracked liquefied natural gas and nuclear energy as sustainable forces of energy, uh, sustainable forms of energy. Pipelines which carry fracked oil and liquefied natural gas 
of course, have been primary sites of indigenous struggle in recent memory. Of course, the Dakota Access Pipeline, Keystone XL, really important struggles happening in British Columbia and Canada as we speak. A transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources revolves around key, key resources, especially lithium and rare earths. So far as this transition is taking place under monopoly control, it repeats and renews the militarized control of resources that has defined the fossil fuels era. Remember, when the coup happened in Bolivia and Evo Morales was removed from power, Bolivia having the largest lithium reserves in the world, Elon Musk wrote on Twitter, we will coup whomever we want. In fall 2021, General Motors announced the availability of an electric Hummer for the suggested retail price of $110,295, which mirrors a proposed green transition in the US military to make it a more lethal fighting force by altering the logistics of fuel. At the COP26 climate meeting in Glasgow, Nancy Pelosi asserted, this is according to the official transcript, that the climate crisis is a national security issue as a cause for migration conflict over habitat and resources. She's saying the, the US military will be necessary to defend the southern border from climate refugees. In its 2022 report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, found that approximately half of the assessed species on Earth have already shifted to the Earth's poles or to higher elevations. Extremes of climate and weather are driving displacement and involuntary migration from the very same parts of the world that Du Bois focused on in 1915. The IPCC found that historical and ongoing patterns of inequity, such as colonialism, are shaping climate-induced vulnerability, particularly for indigenous peoples. In his report, the IPCC focused on hunger and disease. Climate change has already exposed millions of people to acute food insecurity, and reduced water security. Indigenous peoples are particularly affected by sudden losses of food production and access to food. Almost half of humanity currently experiences severe water scarcity for at least some part of the year. Climate change has also increased the prevalence of food and waterborne diseases, such as cholera. Hunger and disease alongside the increased tempo of war by the US and its allies over the past decade have spurred migration. According to the UN Refugee Agency, 89.3 million people were forcibly displaced in 2021, larger than the populations of Iran, Turkey, or any European country. This would actually be the 17th largest country in the world. The United States and Europe have been steadily moving their borders southward, stationing troops in Africa and Latin America. In this context, we see the return of fascism, rebranded in polite society as nationalism. Atmospheric scientists have found that the first historical period of European colonization of this hemisphere corresponded with a transformation of Earth's atmosphere theorizing that this transformation was triggered by the speed and the scale of death. The genocide of indigenous peoples, in other words, is registered in the air that we breathe. The colonization of the so-called new world has altered the earth itself. Mining for silver and gold over time has given way to mining for copper, lead, and lithium. Massive old growth forests were were clear cut and replaced with slave based plantation monoculture, precursors of the agribusiness estates of our own time. Land and people were remade into real estate. I've discussed imperialism as a method of class rule. In December 2017, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights visited the United States, finding that the immense wealth and expertise of the US 
stand in shocking contrast with the conditions in which vast numbers of its citizens live. The U.S. has the highest rate of in income inequality, the highest youth poverty, and the highest infant mortality rates among comparable OECD states. Radicable diseases are increasingly prevalent. In practice, the report notes, the United States is alone among developed countries in insisting that while human rights are of fundamental importance, they do not include rights that guard against dying of hunger, dying from a lack of access to affordable health care, or growing up in a context of total deprivation. Last April, the Poor People's Campaign released a report on the pandemic, which found that people in poorer counties have died at twice the rate of people in wealthier counties in the United States. During the Delta wave from August to November 2021, death rates in the poorest counties were five times higher than they were in the wealthiest counties. And they show that this can't be explained by uneven vaccination rates. The vaccination rates uh, were roughly equivalent across these divide. About 31 million people live in these counties, which include 27% of indigenous people within US borders. What purpose can be served by studying the imperialist roots of the USA? How can this lead us towards positive action rather than towards narcissistic guilt or pessimistic nihilism? What can be clarified when we understand North America as part of the larger colonized world? In the African Roots of War, Du Bois argued that land, education, and sovereignty for the colonies would offer humanity a path to peace. Studying movements against imperialism clarifies common elements of an anti-imperialist platform. It begins with the return of land, from the colonizer to the colonized, from the landlord to the cultivator, the tenant. Land reform has taken shape in relation to a social revolution, which across the colonized world has focused particularly on women's rights, education, and access to healthcare. The radical edge of the anti-colonial movements of the early 20th century had their origins in movements to reform marriage and women's divorce and inheritance rights. We can learn from these movements to address our own situation, not least the right-wing assault on reproductive rights. Imperialism produces mass illiteracy. From World War I onward, campaigns for mass literacy have given shape to anti-colonial movements. Just a few days ago, the New York City public school system, the largest school district in the United States, released the news that almost two thirds of students in grades three through six tested below their grade level math last spring. In our contemporary situation of right-wing attacks on schools and teachers, we have much to learn from anti-imperialist struggles for education, literacy, and culture. Imperialism degrades people's health. Two weeks ago, the US government released the news that overall life expectancy in, the, in this country is now 76.1 years, which was the life expectancy in 1996. Indigenous people have the lowest life expectancy of any racial or ethnic group in the US at 65.2 years. And for historical comparison, overall male life expectancy in the United States was 65.2 years in 1949. Decolonization movements across the world cohered around campaigns for rural health care, mass vaccination, and access to water and nutrition. Cuba's medical internationalism stands as one of the high points of this history. In 1989, Representative John Conyers introduced legislation to establish a commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. The bill was killed in committee until it was reintroduced in 2021 after Conyers' death, and it now awaits a floor vote 
on the House of Representatives. This bill can provide a method to study the history of imperialism in the United States, to consider historical responsibilities, to propose different futures, and to forge new unities in the process of realizing those futures. The US National Anthem closes by invoking the land of the free and the home of the brave. For the American right, these words invoke a sense of loss. For parts of the American left, these same words invoke an unfulfilled promise. When we take a clear look at the history that I briefly discussed here, these lines are actually in need of revision. The home of the enslaved. I've discussed the imperialist roots of the USA. A tree's roots, of course, impart their specific characteristics to every branch, every leaf, every fruit the tree produces. This suggests that for the sake of our professed ideals, for the sake of our humanity, for the sake of life on planet Earth, we urgently need to cultivate different trees. We need to reforest this land. Thank you. That was really amazing. Um, I want to remind you, you have these little Q, these sheets with QR codes. Uh, for those of you who are in the audience, you can use this to put questions up. Uh, and then on Zoom, there's also, you can put your questions in the chat and we have a great team sitting in the front furiously uh, sorting through your questions and, and forwarding them to us. So, so please take a minute um, to do that. And, um, so just as you're thinking about those questions, I'm going to ask a question which I often like to ask um, speakers when they come, and I'm going to move over and sit down, um, because we have a lot of student, students who are listening, and I think for many students, um, it's hard to imagine how you get from your undergraduate or early graduate studies to doing work at this level. So could you say something about your own intellectual development and um, maybe offer some hope or help <laughs> for our students? Um, yeah, thanks. I think, well, there's, there's two directions maybe I can answer that question. One is the question of colonialism. In my family, I grew up hearing stories about, not colonialism, but what my family members, what my ancestors had done to fight against colonialism. Um, you know, it was presented in such a way as a child growing up that it became a part of my identity, you know, associated with part of my identity my culture, fighting against colonialism. And growing up here um, and thinking about the fight against colonialism in other parts of the world, but also thinking about the nature of colonialism, the historical struggle against colonialism in the places where I'm living. Um, you know, from, from a pretty young age for me, it became, it felt necessary to begin studying that. Um, you know, and I think as a, what I felt was an extension of stories that I heard, had heard from my family. Mm -hmm. But this project in particular, I, I began graduate school, where I began working on this project in the fall of, 2000, uh, in the fall of 2001. And I was attending graduate school at NYU. And actually, 9-11 happened um, on a day when I was supposed to um, have a seminar. I was living in my parents' house in New Jersey and commuting in. And of course realize, oh, I'm not going to school today. And living there, living in New York at the time, living in a diaspora community and experiencing the smells of 9-11, the fear of 9-11, the discussions of unity and the displays of unity at the same time that there were stories circulating through the community of people's family members disappearing, not knowing where your grandfather, or your uncle is. All of these things in a heightened moment raise a number of questions about, for me, about the nation and about unity and about those of us who are outside of the nation. Um, and so that's, I think, the entry point to this project about the railroad, but also about Chinese people, right, who are racialized as aliens, um, then and now and indigenous people, 
who are racialized somehow as external, before, prior, outside of the nation. Two groups which don't seem to have politically or historically or culturally a connection, but I wanted to think about what actually connects these, these two groups, these two sets of histories. So I think that's how I first came to that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, we have other questions coming in. So I'm just gonna, I'll be reading questions that have been submitted. Um, so the first question uh, that draws on that to some extent, uh, could you draw a parallel, if there is one, between the land grab for the railroad and the Morrill Land Act that provided financial resources for universities like UMass? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And not just a, not just a parallel, but you know, a, a historical relationship. These, these mechanisms were happening at the same time, in the same historical period. And I think one of the really interesting things when we study, when we study with historical specificity, mm -hmm. that we can see that the techniques, the instruments, here we're talking about finance and the formation of institutions, they were similar, they were not just similar, oftentimes it was the same people uh -huh. writing the laws. Um, it was the same institutions patch it, packaging the bonds and the shares and selling them on the market. It was the same set of people um, advertising these new investments. It was overlapping groups of people investing. So there's a, there's a direct relationship, I think, between the establishment of these universities and the construction of the rail network. Another way we could think of it is the land grants, you know, establish universities to provide engineering, certain kinds of technical expertise, mm -hmm. agricultural, um, ranching, and engineering expertise. Mm -hmm. All expertise that became necessary mm -hmm. with the construction of the railroad and then the expansion of the mining and ranching and, and timber and, and agricultural economies in relation to the railroad. So there's a there's a very close, I think, historical connection between them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Du Bois. So Du Bois is coming from a Pan-African perspective of imperialism. Could you explain how race is a part of Du Bois's analysis of capitalism and imperialism? And more broadly, what is the relationship between white supremacy and imperialism? Um, well, that's a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> And I think if we look at the African roots of war, which I think is an, a really, it's an essay that I think offers a lot for us in this historical moment we're living in now, mm -hmm. not because history repeats itself, but just the methods. Um, there's a war happening. Everyone's horrified that this war is happening. And there's, they're scrambling to explain why it's happening. And Du Bois starts to answer why it's happening. And he gives us certain methods, evidence that he looks to, um, how to read histories, how to look at geographies. And I think those methods from the African roots of war for us now can be useful in understanding our moment. In this essay, he writes about what he calls the dividends of whiteness, which I think is an interesting phrase. Those of us who study Du Bois Many of us know the phrase, the wages of whiteness from his book, Black Reconstruction. In the wages of whiteness, he's using this concept to try to answer, how can we explain how poor white people in the Southern United States during Reconstruction went against their material interests? During Reconstruction, there's the establishment of public school systems. There's an establishment of accessible medical institutions. There's an establish, establishment of finance, of financial institutions that make loans and credit accessible to, to poor people in a way that wasn't accessible mm -hmm. before. Poor white people are seeing their lives materially improving and their children's lives materially improving. And yet they go against all of these policies that are making their lives better. Um, they end up poor, sicker, less educated as a result of the policies that they support. How can we explain that? How can we understand how that happened? In Black Reconstruction, he explains that with this idea of the wages of whiteness. And the wages of whiteness aren't wages, it's not money. It's a, it's a, it's a bitter kind of thing because the wages of whiteness are logical. It's purely the feeling of superiority, the sense that 
You know, I may be poor. I, my children may never be able to go to school. I may never be able to, uh, you know, go to the doctor or access any credit to buy up land or buy a house. But at least I'm not black. I'm white. That's the wages of whiteness. You can't eat it. You know, it won't, it won't help you. Uh, it won't make your life better. But that's the wages of whiteness. That's his explanation for this. In the African Roots of War, which was written a couple of decades earlier, he has a term, the dividends of whiteness, which is interesting. Because yeah. wages is something you receive when you do work, right? You go to work, you receive the wages later. Dividends is kind of like what I talked about, monopolies collect rent. The dividends is passive income that comes to you based on your investments. So the dividends of whiteness is passive, passive income that's coming to working class people in the United States and Europe that's providing the possibility for the expansion of democracy. He writes about in the African Roots of War. The possibility of the expansion of democracy. In Europe, this was the era of, of social democracy. The Labour Party, the SPD in Germany. Um, large working class parties that are materially making the lives of working class people in Europe better, within constraints, within capitalism, still exploited, but their lives are getting better. Du Bois explains this as the dividends of whiteness, that this is passive income coming from this taxation, um, this drain of wealth from the colonies, from the African continent, from South Asia, from, from China, um, from the Southern Pacific, he writes. He, he focuses on these regions in the essay. Um, and so I think in the arc of Du Bois's very long career, there are lessons for us if we study carefully in different historical moments, how he's thinking about the relationship between capitalism and race, capitalism or imperialism and whiteness, how that changes in different moments. Um, but I think he's always attentive to the material dimensions of it. And he's always asking this question, how can we explain how working class white people, poor white people go against their material interests? They betray their own interests. They make their lives materially worse mm -hmm. by supporting policies that somehow build up a sense of superiority. So with all of this, would you say, would Du Bois embrace a term like white supremacy? I mean, talking about the dividends and wages of whiteness is, it's so sophisticated, you know, effective because it's really getting at the economic roots, not just the sense of entitlement, but, but deeper than that. Um, white supremacy is the term that people are familiar with today or that gets used. Would he have embraced that term? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't remember right now offhand, um, you know, if and how it appears in his writing. But he writes a lot, you know, again, if we're careful readers of Du Bois, he writes about the economic dimension, the political dimension, the psychological dimension, the geographic dimension. He writes in an essay, whiteness is this belief made real that a white person can go anywhere in the world um, and behave as they like uh, with impunity. Um, which again, if we think about the politics of borders and the pushing of borders southward and that crazy thing that Pelosi said in Glasgow, you know, there's something, there's a counterpart. I think there's lessons that we can take from Du Bois from an earlier moment to mm -hmm. think about our own moment. Yeah, that specificity of breaking it down into particular things. Um, yeah. Not just emotional, but, but rational, as you were saying. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, what are the lessons of anti-imperial resistance, particularly in North America in the 18th and 19th centuries? And uh, a related question, where do you find hope? Um, I think in North America, if we look at driving motors, and there's a huge historical literature about this. Of course, the black freedom struggle, the struggle against slavery, um, the, the reverberations and echoes of Haiti and the victory of the Haitian revolutionaries that, that echoes here in North America. And then efforts towards confederation, tribal nations organizing developing diplomacy and new forms of military and political and economic coordination um, that take place in, in different places, in different times. 
Um, I think these offer great historical reservoirs of hope, let's say. Um, and in our own moment, in this moment of the pandemic, um, which you know, we seem to be stumbling through still blindly with even allowing ourselves collectively to acknowledge and grieve what we're living through, I think there's great hope to take from other parts of the world where the pandemic has not killed people like this. Um, other parts of the world that don't have technology that we don't, that, you know, they don't have any access to technology that we don't have. They don't have any kind of, you know, magic or anything. They just have a political will, political processes, and decisions about how to use their resources mm -hmm. and collective cultures, public cultures of action um, that have helped people to survive uh, and not have to die the way that, we, that we're dying. I think there's great hope for us if uh, those of us in North America could, um, could drop some of our arrogance and study the innovations and the experiments of people in the poorer parts of the world. Um, there's incredible innovations and incredible hope there and dynamism. Yeah, thank you. All right, how should current students hold the UMass administration accountable for supporting US imperialism, both at home and abroad. For example, hosting military contractors such as Raytheon and Lockheed Martin at student job fairs and hosting organizations which sponsor birthright colonization trips of Palestine. And other audience members are asking, what role can working class people and leftists in the United States play in fighting US empire? That's another great question and another huge question. And, uh, and of course, I don't know UMass in the specific situation here, but something that's on my mind very much is the hurricane that hit uh, the Caribbean. Um, and the fact that, you know, Cuba is devastated by this hurricane and Cuba is under a whole host of sanctions and is also listed as a state sponsor of terrorism by the United States government. It's something that working class people can do. It's something that um, students and universities can do is to push our representatives, our senators, our government to remove these sanctions, to remove this designation that Cuba is a state sponsor of terrorism. Um, to answer to the world um, that's voted for decades now in the United Nations and the General Assembly against the, the blockade, what the Americans call the embargo of Cuba. Um, so pension funds, um, our, our pension funds, how are pension funds investing in uh, institutions that are pushing these sanctions. Um, what institutions can we use? If you belong to a church, if you belong to a union, can your church or your union send milk or eggs, you know, just much needed supply uh, to Cuba to help people right now? I think those are some ways we can learn, work with each other, your HOA, your community neighbor, your community organizations, work with our neighbors, work with others in our communities and, and start to learn about our debt to our neighbors. Um, uh, you know, take seriously that question of reparations, um, start to study that and start to put that into practice. So I think there's work we can do in all of our institutions, including the university. And that's something we can do now, like this week. Yeah, not to give in to despair, but to take action and to, to work together, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. How does the US media reinforce misconceptions about US history and its current place in the world? Example, Ukraine, inflation, military spending. Another audience member asked a related question. How would you characterize the American support for Ukraine? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think on the question of the media, it's something that I think is really difficult for those of us living in the United States to really fully understand and comprehend, maybe until we leave the United States, especially leave and visit parts of the global South, how isolated we are from the rest of the world, how isolated we are from the rest of humanity. And a large, a large part of that is, is the media. Um, um, I think there's, it takes a lot of work um, 
but there's media that we can access, that we can read. I think we all <laughs> should be reading as much as we can the news. Um, and that includes the corporate US media, but there's also independent media. And there's also media that's produced outside of the United States. Um, and I think taking in as many viewpoints as possible um, would, would be good for us, would do us well. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's obviously one of the major, major issues that we're confronting. Um, on Ukraine, I don't want to give a great a di direct or clear answer on Ukraine, except there's a couple of things. One is just the shocking drive towards war. Um, I think this is echoed in Du Bois in his essay, The African Roots of War, but also in Du Bois in his work later in his life um, as an advocate for peace and an end to the war against Korea. Um, and for that advocacy, of course, he was put on trial by the United States. Um, what would peace look like in this moment? What are the obstacles to peace in Ukraine in this moment? Um, and what can we in our institutions, um, what can we as those of you who, who have the right to vote, what can we do to remove those obstacles to peace? Um, so I'll just leave it at that. And one other thing, for those of us who want to analyze, one reason I don't want to give an answer is because I think what's more important than an answer from me is a method. Um, what can we learn from a method from someone like Du Bois Again, how to analyze our situation. What sources should we read to understand what is the nature of US policy right now? What is driving NATO policy right now? How do we understand the relationship between Russia and Ukraine and their history? I think there are methods, if we read Du Bois closely, methods that can tell us about the kinds of sources we should look for and how we can evaluate and, and analyze those sources in order to arrive at our own conclusions. That's the idea of imperialism, a, a rational explanation of imperialism that requires evidence. I could give you an answer. I could appeal to your emotions, but you know, we, can actually, we can actually learn methods. And part of that is to figure out how to answer these questions for ourselves. And then we can debate with each other. We can enter and debate with our evidence using these methods. Thank you. Um, we have time for, I think, one more question. Um, so you said that you talked about imperialism as not a government policy, uh, that imperialism is a form of class rule. Does the Democratic Party advance imperialism, and are we advancing U.S. imperialism by voting for Democrats? Yeah, I mean, part of, that, uh, part of the implications of that is you can't vote out imperialism. It's not, you know, that you can have a better election. Um, when I say imperialism is a method of class rule, it's partly about the form and the structure of the state that we live under. Um, it's partly about what is the shared common sense in the society that we live under. And it's partly the challenge of developing a counter pole to that common sense, um, a counter way of governing ourselves. It demands, I think, of us a unity, um, a question of unification, a clarity that the interests of most of us in this pandemic are not aligned with the interests of most of the people who are making the policies in this pandemic. There's a beginning there for a basis for thinking about unities, material unities. Um, and we don't need to wait for people who are making decisions to figure out proposals. There are things we can do to think about how can we give, how can we find out who in our neighborhood needs food? Who needs to isolate in this moment? How can we get them food? Um, how can we make sure they're not alone if they're isolating? How can we provide them a space, a safe place to rest if they need to quarantine and isolate from others? A roof, um, universities with dorm rooms, with cafeterias actually can be institutions that can re be really productive in these kinds of ways. So to think of imperialism as class rule is also th to think about um, our sets of identities and our sets of identifications and the new forms of identities that we actually could forge, um, the new ways of acting together with each other. And in that process, the new unities, right? New, new ways of understanding, oh, I, I belong to this neighborhood. And that means, you know, I, I know that there are these people in my building who are 
quarantining right now. And I, I know that um, this neighbor on this floor is gonna make sure that they've got groceries this week. And next week I'll take care of them. Um, you know, it's, I think it, it can start with something as direct and simple as that. But yeah, it can't be, uh, imperialism is not a policy we can vote out. And yes, the Democratic Party um, absolutely is, uh, is um, along with the Republican Party, um, across the arc of U.S. history has been um, forging and maintaining and sustaining this policy. To answer that directly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so we are nearing the end of our time. And so um, I just want to uh, uh, First of all, thank you very much for your talk and for taking the time to answer our questions. It was, um, I learned a lot and it was great to uh, hear you talk about these things. Um, I wanna point out that he's mentioned uh, W.E.B. Du Bois in this essay several times tonight. And so, um, yes, we have the W.E.B. Du Bois papers here. They are completely digitized so you can read them from the quiet of your own home, but you can also you know, go and look at them in the archives and, and read his writings, read his correspondence. I really, really encourage you to do this. Um, uh, you'll have a chance through this, um, through this Feinberg series. Um, next Monday, there is going to be a, a Breakfast with Du Bois virtual reading group that's hosted by the Du Bois Center here at UMass. Uh, and they will be reading this and discussing this essay, uh, The African Roots of War piece uh, that, that uh, Dr. Kaluga talked about in today's lecture. Um, and there's also uh, the next event for the Weinberg series um, is US Empire in Asia and the Pacific. Um, and um, there's a Teaching Empire workshop series for K-12 educators. So please keep checking back on our website to find our other upcoming events, um, which uh, will all be, I think, wonderful and informative. And so thank you again to all the people behind the scenes who worked so hard to make this possible. I'm not gonna name names because I'll start forgetting people if I do that, but, um, and thank you all for coming tonight. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs>